I work at a bank and、um, I assist personal and premier bankers. And my area of specialty is consumer time accounts and retirement accounts. So I know a little bit about safe deposit boxes, checking accounts, savings accounts, and all that stuff. But I specialize in consumer time accounts and retirement accounts and stuff like that. Okay, oh, that sounds pretty cool. So, why did you decide to go into this profession? Okay, so、um, I am an international student, so I'm from Zimbabwe. And so I am studying accounting and finance.、Okay. So I wanted to have some outside of class experience. So I was taking some finance classes, and I loved some of them, but some of them were kind of not exactly what I wanted. Mm-hmm. So, I, I thought the best way to make a decision whether this would be the best thing for me to do was、yeah. to find something that's related to accounting and finance and actually do it.、Mm-hmm. So, that's how I ended up thinking okay, let me look for something in a bank. And then I got the job, and、yeah. it was something that helps with my major. So, that's how I ended up doing it. Okay, definitely. You said you're、uh, still in school.、Uh, when do you finish? So, I'm going to finish. I'm left with one year and one semester, so like three semesters to go now. Oh, okay. Oh, that's pretty exciting. All right. So,、um, what education do you need to be a personal、uh, banker assistant? So, they say you have to have some college experience, and then, but this is just me. I don't think you need to go to school to do that because I think. Um, go, some college is not necessarily something that's going to give you the skill to do the job. I just think if you have good training and if you、um, work the job for a little bit, you should be able to do the job. It's that simple. For a lot of the jobs, I do understand that all these professions, some of them will tell you, oh, you need to have a degree in this and that.、Mm-hmm. But This is just my opinion. I think a lot of the professions you don't need to go to school to get it right. I just think you need、um, good training. I think you need、um, somebody who just shows you、um, on the job training. I would say on the job training is the best way to learn, I、mm. think. So I feel like school is slowly becoming old fashioned, kind of. That's... When it comes to these kinds of professions, I mean, don't get me wrong, school is good and it does give you、um, some good skills and probably will widen your、um, choices、mm-hmm. and what you can do with it. But I really don't think you need to go to school to、okay. do this. So, what、mm-hmm. kind of skills、uh, do you think one needs to have to be able to, to be successful in this position? So, you have to have. The skills to kind of、um, mathematical skills, that's for sure. You have to, you, you, can't, you can't be bad in math because you get some people who don't understand very simple things and they find it very difficult to understand because there's a lot of algorithms and there's a lot of、um, different things that they use to calculate some things. And I feel like、um, when you go into banking, when it comes to investment things and stuff like that, they find a way of, I don't know whether it's they're trying to complicate it or it's their way of making money. So it has to be a scheme. It can't be straightforward. So because it's not that straightforward and they're looking for make the most money without having to pay you a lot of money. So I think at the end of the day, there ends up being all these complicated ways of. Figuring things out and explaining things and solving things. So, you get a lot of bankers who don't have a clue what's going on, or they think they know, but、yeah. they really don't know. That's true. Okay. So, what does a typical day look like for you? So,、um, a lot of the time, it's on the phone. So, you're、mm-hmm. talking with bankers, and、um, it's, it's almost like Most of it is trouble, is almost like I would call it troubleshooting because、um, you have, and then there's some things which bankers cannot do. They don't have the authority to do that. 
So mm -hmm. I have the authority to do that and I have more advanced systems than they would have in the branch that they would use mm -hmm. with a customer who's in front of them or with a customer who's going to come into the branch. So there are some things that I can do that they can't do or some things that I have access to. So a typical day would be calls, emails. There's lots of emails, which is mm -hmm. irritating, but that's the job. And then yeah. there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of stuff that you just do in the system. It's almost like, because for a lot of the stuff in banking, you do something on the computer and you have to do something in the branch. So it's almost like what you do on the computer and what you do in the branch has to match. So there's a lot of back office work that's done to match mm -hmm. what's been done in the branch by the customer when they walk into the branch. So is your position uh, customer facing? like in an office or like it's uh you just kind of at the back doing transactions so i don't talk to customers oh okay which is a good thing um and i don't see uh -huh. customers so okay. all i can do is and i think it's 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 because um it kind of complicates things if i would have to talk to the customer i really like that part if i i think mm -hmm. if i had to talk to the customer i'd think about it because it's kind of difficult to deal with customers directly but when you deal with bankers, a lot of the times they're not angry. They are actually looking for your help. So because they're looking for help from you, mm -hmm. they, um, some of them, I'm not going to say all of them, because some of them don't like what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, maybe because um, they are in a bad position. Maybe they fail to explain something and the customer is getting angry. And maybe the customer knows a little bit more than them. Because yes. sometimes you have those situations and then they say something which the, ba which the customer knows is wrong and then the customer puts so much pressure on them and then when they call, they're a little bit angry. You can feel their tension, but yes. it's not as bad. I, I would rather deal with a banker than deal with a customer. Oh, okay, okay. I think I'm understanding more <laughs> of the position. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what would you say are the pros and cons of this uh, profession, of this career path? I will tell you one thing, you yeah. learn a lot. One, two, there's like a lot of personal knowledge that you learn about investments and all mm -hmm. this stuff with money mm -hmm. that nobody would have told you. I don't like, I've spoken with people who work in banks. I have friends who work financial positions, their financial advice and, and, and all these things, but you don't get, you don't just get this information. I feel like sometimes you have to be in the system to kind of understand how it works. Because like I told you, mm -hmm. it's a trick. Yeah. That's the business. It's a trick. It's not meant to be plain because not everybody should understand what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it has to be done so quickly and so swiftly and so skillfully mm -hmm. and confuse the layman. So the layman is not going to understand or is going to get the least out of the deal. Mm -hmm. for the bank to get the most out of it. And that's why they're banks. They're rich. That's oh. just how they do it. So does your position work for the bank or for the the customers? Or it's kind of like... So both. Okay. So okay. I work for the customer in the sense that um, I can explain to the banker so that they can explain to the customer. Okay. And then I work for the bank in the sense that I do the work that they need to show, to reflect on the customer's account or something that they need to request on the customer's profile or something that needs to be updated or something that needs to be changed or um, sometimes it can be restraints. Like sometimes you get somebody who is deceased and then when they pass away, people want to come and claim their money. They mm -hmm. probably don't have the rights to just come and get the money. So there's some kind of restraints that you need to put on some of the accounts. So it's almost like I do both. I'm oh. like the middleman who does a little bit of customer related work and a little bit of bank work. Oh, okay. We have a question here. So what's the biggest, most blowing thing you've ever learned? Is that you have to be, um, let me tell you one. It's just, it's going to be a little bit long for me to explain it, but mm -hmm. so for consumer time accounts, it's a mm -hmm. good way. It's, it's, it's a sure way of making money. In other words, if you're going to put your money in there, chances that you're going to lose the money are almost slim unless you have to take it out before the term is up. But mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about the term 
you have to be very careful about the interest rates because mm -hmm. um right now we get a lot of people who are coming to open up time accounts and i can tell you that people are scrounging and really trying to open up these cds for 2. Point something percent time accounts are the same as gic's guaranteed investment certificates or Yes, they are um certificate of deposits. Okay. So they it's almost like um locking your money in for a certain amount of time to get a certain percent interest on it. So a lot of people now they come and lock in some money for like right now the interest rates are somewhere around 2% and round about that area and they are saying that they've really gone up from where they were. Mm -hmm. Um so if you pick specific terms, you get a good interest rate. If mm -hmm. you pick bad terms, you get a bad interest rate take for example you can get 2.5% if you pick a term for 11 months but if you pick a term for 12 months you can get 0.1% that's a huge difference 0.1 and 2% that is a huge difference why is there a difference but here's the thing all the things that they actually give you a big interest rate those numbers are irregular numbers because people say i want to lock my money in for 2 years so 24 months mm -hmm. but you would never get good interest rates for fixed numbers like 12 months 24 months blah 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 no it's always okay. 19 months 36 months 11 months like there's always a twist somewhere and you won't catch it so you have to know that oh okay and then they tell you stuff like if you open an a consumer time account um if it goes into maturity they give you seven calendar days to either close it without a penalty or if you don't close it it's going to automatically renew into another cd yeah, yeah so here's the catch when it if you don't come into the branch to change the term and rate yeah it's going to default to that 0.1% rate so okay. that's how it is but if you come into the branch and say okay my cd is in the grace period so i want to change it i want to put it back at 11 months you will still get the 2. Point something percent. Yeah. So it's like you're actually not getting a lot because mm -hmm. if you are doing stocks and bonds and all these things it's riskier but you would make more money out of it. But now when you do CDs, you also have to be smart because you're already not making a lot of money. But mm -hmm. if you are not smart about it, you will make way less than yeah. you are actually supposed to make. So that's like the biggest thing I've learned that if you're going to invest your money in a bank account, don't just put it there and just forget that oh well I put my money in the account and it's going to grow. No, it's not magic. They they are smart. They they know people would do that. So you're obviously not going to make money out of doing that because they're just going to set it up in such a way that you they make more out of you doing that because if you are going to put in your money and you get 0.1% when they loan out that money they are not loaning mm. it at 0.1% yeah. they are loaning it out at a much higher percentage yeah. so they don't they like people who are ignorant why mm. because if you're ignorant they make more money out of you than somebody who comes and gets the 2% cuz now they pay you 2% yes they're not going to they're going to make profit out of it but they make less profit than they would from someone who has 0.05% trust me i have seen people with hundreds of thousands of cds with 0.05% and been like wow i wish i knew you so i could tell you so uh the whose responsibility is it to educate our clients on this is it the advisors the ones who do the face to face uh conversation with the clients or would it be um you as a as a personal banker assistant and sorry for those who are joining us she is from the US um She's a premium. Her name is Chipo Chache. She's a premium personal banker assistant. So thank you for joining us. Continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not yeah. anybody's responsibility. So when okay. you open the account, they just tell mm -hmm. you this information and they give you um those new account kits and all these things. So it's this booklet with all this information which nobody ever reads. Yes, love. So because you never read that, you don't know. Some people will come and tell you, "Oh, I've had my CD for 12 years. I want to know how much interest I've made." There's hundreds of thousands, but they've only made $37 interest. And they're like, "Okay. I'm sorry, but that's what happened." And then they'll be mad, they'll close the account and take it to another branch, blah blah blah, but if you close it outside the grace, they are still going to charge you a penalty. So they they will still make their money. So uh -huh. it's almost like you have to constantly 
be checking on it, be f- trying to figure right. out what what can I make the most out of right now, what's out there, because you'll comfortably sit at home and not get anything. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's a really good lesson or something to know, right? Uh, so what are your typical work hours in a week? So because, so being an international student, you have to go to school and go to work. So I work, I end up working until 8 p.m. a lot of the times. I, I, I would say my work hours are really bad. So I I set up my schedule in such a way that I incorporate both school and work in my schedule. So mm-hmm. my schedule, I usually finish, I, I start work or school at 9 a.m. Monday to Thursday. Friday, like today, I don't have any classes. So I work from 9 a.m. till 8 p.m. And then on Saturday, I work like from 9 until 6 p.m. And then, mm-hmm. so my only, I have a day off during the week, which is, my day off is Thursday. But I have classes oh. until like almost the end of the day. So the the schedule is quite flexible because they open at 8 in the morning, if I'm not mistaken, 7.30 or 8, but I think it's 8. And then they close at 8 p.m. And good thing is, um, th- if you work until 8, from 4.30, from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., they actually give you a bonus for working oh. that period of time of the day. So you get, I think it's 0.2 or 0.25 extra on your paycheck for those hours, for each day that you work those hours. So it's oh. accommodating for students and people who have a busy schedule. But then you cannot work anything less than 30 hours. So you have to work at least 30 hours a week. Okay. So as an international student, were there or are there any uh, special requirements or things that you have to do in order to um, be a a personal banker assistant? Um, Besides the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it differs with the college and the school and whatever it is, but I know Mm -hmm. for my school, you have to have taken... Um, so what happens is like classes are classified into levels. So there's 100 level classes, then 200 level, a little bit more difficult, 300, 400. So you have to have taken a certain number of 300 level classes in your major oh. for you to be able to actually do something off campus that's related to your major. So okay. I don't think it, non-international students have to do that. They can just apply for the job and just do it. But because you're an international student, for you to actually do it legally, you have to go through that process and do the paperwork. And, and it's it's a lot. Like, the paperwork is tiring and tedious and it's annoying, but you got to do mm-hmm. what you got to do. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So what are the usual career paths um, from, this, from this position? What's the next step? So um, a lot of the people, they start off... Um, working the, um, so they start with like one one queue so there's a CD, consumer time accounts which I will call I, I, when I say CDs I mean consumer time accounts and then there's retirement accounts then there's people who do um, checking and savings accounts only then there's people who do um, the legal side which mm-hmm. is to talk about disease processing to talk about people who have um, guarantors and um, people who are disabled who have somebody who has who assists them or people who are really old because we have a lot of people who are really old who are abused so you get someone who has been beaten up by someone and they're told go and get that money and give it to me so there are people who are trained to learn and figure out that oh okay so it looks like this adult is being coerced to get this money out so Here's what we're going to do. So there's like a lot of levels. So for you, usually from where I am right now, the next step would be to go into something like the legal side where you're now dealing with more complicated things. This is power of attorneys. This is court orders. This is minors. This is um, everything to do with with anything that can end up getting somebody into trouble with the law. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that stuff. And then the next step would be... um, And that's within the location, which is where I am. The next step would be to go to the resolution team. The resolution team deals with people who say, 
oh, this happened to my account. And because a lot of the cases which I have personally um, experienced are people who have a retirement account or something. So with a retirement mm -hmm. account, if you take money out and you take it out in your name, so you make the check made payable to yourself, and if you take it out there, we are going to have to report it to the IRS that you came and took money out. And the okay. IRS is going to look at it and say you took money out, so that was income, so they'll charge you for it. Yeah. So sometimes you end up owing taxes. So then there are some people who come and say, well, when I came to get that check, I told you that I want to do a transfer. I wasn't trying to do a distribution. So now that the IRS is telling me that I owe money, blah, 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 I want to sue you or I'm angry or something then that's something that we have to be very careful about because we don't want to be in the news because we've been in the news before. So what happens is um, they end up escalating you to the resolution team. So the resolution team, they open up a case, then they call the customer if they need to call the customer and work with the banker and um, try and resolve it. Before it blows out of proportion or sometimes some people will actually come into the branch with their attorney they've already taken it up but they have to contain it so then you go to the resolution team a lot of people say the resolution team is fun but they say it's a lot of work and it's very demanding of your attention so you can't be absent-minded like you have to be alert when you're doing the job and you have to understand what's going on because you can't have the, the customer two steps ahead of you you just have to be on top of everything. And then from there, then you're now going into different locations because if you are now going to step up from there, you're now going into different positions. So you can be a manager, but mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they come out of there, now they want to go and be something else that's different, but they're going to be working at a branch or in the bigger offices or something. But mm -hmm. at, the le at, at, at the center where I work, that those are like the hierarchies of kind of what it is. And then the more things you get trained in and the more things you can help bankers with, like if you can help with checking and savings, if you can help with retirements, if you can help with CDs, if you can help with all these things, they, the more things you take, the more money you get paid per hour. Oh, okay. So oh. it's kind of oh. like rewarding, but it's a lot of work. Because then that means you don't have like space between issues and things to resolve. To, to take a breath especially when it's busy but it's it's doable so is there um a minimum time on post that you have to spend at let's say you're just doing check-ins and accounts and savings and then is there a minimum time that you have to spend doing that before you can move on to dealing with uh maybe retirement accounts so they usually give you like um so it's it's not necessarily minimum accounts. So because you, we get QA, so there's QA quality assurance. So what they do is um, they record your calls, they track what you're doing online. So um, because sometimes you're supposed to leave remarks because it all works hand in hand. If somebody went, goes and puts remarks on the account, when you need something, you have to just go and look at the remarks. You can see what remarks oh. they put on there. So then you know what to do or what's going on without having to talk to someone to explain it to you. So um, QA can like just pick randomly. So I think each month everybody gets five QAs on like different things. So they look at mm -hmm. your QAs. They look at your adherence. So that means um, so you have a schedule. And after every like two hours, you get like a 15 minute break and then you get a lunch break. And then at the end of the day, you get like a 10 minute break just oh, just before your shift ends. So you get enough breaks. So they look at, do you go to lunch on time and come back on time? Do you not take an exceeded amount of time on breaks? Um, are you efficient? Mm -hmm. so, because sometimes if it's going to be a call, they they can they can they record everything so they have cameras in the screens which can see where your mouse is going what you're doing and everything so they can tell that you were on the call but you were not paying attention and then so because they can track all of that so that's mm -hmm. where 
your promotions are going to come from. And then, so it's almost like um, there's also a feedback thing where sometimes if you help a banker, they're so happy, they'll send you an e-card, which is like saying, oh my, thank you so much. You really helped me. I was really struggling with this customer, blah, blah, blah. So the more e-cards you have, it's almost like a point system. So you're gaining points and points and points. So they do evaluations every four to six months. And then, so if you are lucky and you have good stats, there you go, you get a promotion, you get an offer. Some people don't like to have to do all that extra work, so they'll refuse. No one is going to force you to go into anything extra than that, but you do what you feel comfortable doing. Okay, so are there a lot of advancement opportunities then within um, your company? I would say yes. Like, mm -hmm. there is enough opportunity for you to advance, and I feel like... Um, so I'm personally a person who easily gets bored mm -hmm. with something. I can't do something for a very long time. I, I, I need change. So mm -hmm. there is space for somebody to grow if you're efficient. So if you're doing what you're doing and you're doing things right, sometimes you can even skip steps. Like I know one guy who came and he was really good. He had really good stats and everything. And he simply jumped from having like two or three cues to the resolution team really quickly. So the resolution team is like the highest paid of the people who work at our center. So he quickly jumped onto it. So, so he's been there for like less than two years, but he's already on the resolution team. But then you get some people who tell you, oh, I've been working this job for 12 years. I don't like that. I, I I don't think that's where I see myself. I cannot work that kind of a job for 12 years. But for for now, it works for me. Okay. And uh, so let's say someone is coming in from the outside. They have the experience and the skills. Would they have to start at the entry level? Or would they be able to just come in and go to the resolution um, department? So... Um, it's difficult for you to like just go straight to the resolution team because the resolution team kind of has a little bit of knowledge about everything because mm -hmm. you don't want somebody to come and tell you about a retirement account when you know nothing about it because if mm -hmm. somebody now goes and they are trying to sue you for something and you don't know what they're talking about, you probably are not the right person to be taking up that case because it's almost like the resolution team takes all the serious things like anything where of an extremely irate customer goes to the resolution team or anything that has gone wrong like sometimes you can have someone who brought in a fake id or something and then they the banker didn't do didn't follow the full procedure and they gave somebody's money to the wrong person that's a very serious offense. And then sometimes you get some people who you now try and contact them. You don't know where this person is. You don't know what their number is. You don't even know what their address is. And you're now trying to call them back to come into the branch. And this person is now here. And they're the rightful owner of this like, amount of money. So it's almost like, oh, my goodness. This, it's hard. So uh -huh. you, I, I would say you can't just jump to the resolution team. I wouldn't advise. I, I I don't know. Maybe it's possible. Maybe if they train you, but I I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. To do that, okay. Uh, so what's the expected entry level salary within this? Department? So entry level salary it started. It's between sixteen fifty and I think it's seventeen something. That's like the starting salary dollars per hour. Oh, okay. And then, so now if you work um, that eight-hour shift, I don't, I don't know how much it is. I've never calculated it, but yeah, yeah that's kind of oh. what you get. So okay. it's it's pretty good. I would say it's really good. And for a student, yeah. I don't know if that would be enough for me if I were to had more responsibilities. For a student, it's fine. But oh. I see people who have families and. They make ends meet. The thing is, there's benefits too. So I think mm -hmm. it kind of balances out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our final question that I have, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's looking at uh, venturing into this position? So 
from my experience, right, I don't believe that big corporations are very ethical. So if you are looking for, um, and like they don't value the small things. If you are trying to penetrate the market, I would suggest for somebody to go to a smaller company than to start with a smaller company. It's good to work for a big company. It gives you good exposure and everything, but they don't focus on the foundations of kind of giving somebody a solid ground for what they're doing. Because um, 